be talking about our work, Navion, which is an energy efficient visual inertial odometry accelerator for microrobotics and beyond. Before I start, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. So this work was primarily done by my two students, Amr Soliman and Zhendong Zhang, and in collaboration with Luca Carlone and uh, Sirtesh Karaman in the Aero Astro Department at MIT. So we know that autonomous navigation is becoming increasingly important. Um, already there's many self-driving cars being tested in today's, on today's roads. Um, we know that some companies are looking into having autonomous uh, UAVs or drones deliver packages directly to homes. And also, if you've gone to malls recently, you might have seen some robots being used in the parking lots. And back in Boston, we have Boston Dynamics that's building these four-legged robots that can uh, run autonomously. And these robots continue to shrink. In terms of shrinking robots, one of the focuses of our research is looking at miniaturized robots. And what we mean by this is that the uh, form factors are actually very small. So in terms of drones, we're talking about uh, micro robots that are basically handheld all the way down to picoscaled robots that are the size of a penny. And these robots are very useful for a wide range of applications, in particular navigating um, un unknown environments that are very heavily constrained. So for example, during a large disaster, if there's a search and rescue mission in a collapsed building, these, the size of these robots make them very amenable to uh, moving through very small constrained areas. You can also imagine they're useful for applications like surveillance as well. Um, however, there is a challenge to make these robots autonomous. So let's first go through one of the key steps in autonomous navigation. Um, so there's three key blocks. The first is perception. So the main importance of perception is that it determines where you actually are in an environment, particularly an unknown environment itself. So it allows you to recognize your environments, recognize important objects within the environments, and then locate yourself. Once you know where you actually are as a robot, the next step is to plan the motion in terms of where you determine where you want to go next. And so that involves motion planning. And then finally, you'll have controls, which basically send the control signals to the actuators to move the robot to that particular location. Out of all three of these computation engines, the perception aspect tends to dominate in terms of the compute computation bottleneck. And I'll explain why computation tends to dominate. So the first aspect is that typically in the perception aspect, um, we have to deal with high dimensional data. So in particular, in perception, we're receiving a lot of the data from the sensors itself. So in this particular case, we're looking at visual data. So you can imagine the resolution of these visual images uh, dictate how far we can actually see. So they tend to be higher resolution. And then the frame rate at which we're receiving these images dictate how quickly the robot can go, because effectively the frame rate is sampling our environment. So the faster you want to go, then the faster the frame rate you need to support. But in addition to this very high dimensional data that kind of streams into the chip that you have to process, also in order to see, for example, objects of different sizes, you need to expand this data. So for example, image pyramids are very commonly used in vision applications to detect objects of different scales. In addition to this, um, if we're doing a mapping operation, this map tends to grow in size over time, and we also have to handle this high dimensional data of the map itself. Another challenge, particularly when we talk about these micro robots, is that we need to fit all of this processing on a very small platform. The small platform means that we have very limited battery uh, capacity because we can't have a very large battery. And that also means that we have limitations in terms of how much compute we can actually do on this platform. So even conventional CPUs and GPUs just won't cut it in terms of uh, their energy consumption. So giving you one particular example, if we look at an insect-sized drone or UAV, it would cost around 100 milliwatts to lift this drone. Um, if we're talking about sensing, for example, in camera, using cameras, we're talking about another 100 milliwatts. But if we use the conventional uh, CPUs and GPUs, and even embedded uh, CPUs and GPUs, you're talking about 10 to 100 watts, which is much higher than the other two aspects or components in terms of the uh, power consumption of the system. So it's really important for us to address the computational challenges of uh, this particular robot itself. So in today's talk, I'm going to discuss our work, Navion, which is an energy-efficient visual inertial odometry accelerator. You know, the main function of this is that it achieves energy-efficient real-time localization and mapping. So for real-time performance of 20 frames per second, it can perform that at 2 milliwatts. And then if we look at peak performance, where we can go all the way up to 171 frames per second, we're consuming an average of 24 milliwatts. Um, so in today's talk, I'm going to try and cover all five of these aspects. I'll first give an overview of the algorithm itself. 
Uh, then we'll describe the high-level chip architecture, highlight some of the contributions that we did in order to accelerate the design itself. It won't be able to ha cover all the design aspects. We'll give you some highlights. Um, and then discuss the chip specifications um, and compare it to various different platforms, and then summarize uh, the results in the conclusion of this talk. So let's first walk through the key algorithm, uh, visual inertial odometry, that we use for localization and mapping. So the key idea here is that we take in visual data, so an image sequence from a camera that's mounted on the drone, as well as an IMU, or initial measurement unit, that's also mounted on the drone. And we take the input from these two sensors, and we fuse it, and through these sensors, we detect two important things. We generate two important things. One is localization. So you can see here on the upper right-hand corner, what we're showing is that with the visual data coming in, we're able to estimate the state of the robot itself, particularly both the pose, so which direction the robot is looking at, and also its location within a 3D space. And then the combination of all of these states over time is the trajectory of the robot itself. So you can see a trajectory in the 3D space. Because we're also trying to navigate an unknown environment, we also need to map the environment itself. So that's the other output shown at the bottom uh, right-hand side of the visual inertial odometry. Now, VIO is a subset of the SLAM algorithm. So SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And you may be familiar with that algorithm because it's widely used in the robotics community uh, for localization and mapping. So basically what uh, VIO is, is a subset of SLAM. It's basically SLAM without, bundle, or, sorry, without loop closure. Um, and this is because loop closure is typically done at a lower frequency. And so as a result, it can do, be done offline. Um, so let's walk through the key stages of VIO. In particular, there's two actual stages. So we'll first talk about the front end, which is typically used to process the visual or the sensor data that's coming in. So we'll talk about the vis uh, vision front end first. Um, so it takes in both uh, a stereo input from the camera itself, and it can process the stereo input as both stereo or mono images. In particular, what it's actually trying to do is it's trying to track various landmarks in the environment itself. So you can see from our example here, uh, we have various feature tracks that is tracking these 3D landmarks in the environment appear as 2D features in these actual images, and we want to track them across the different uh, frames or across time. And by tracking these particular features, it gives us a sense of which direction and where the drone is actually looking. So for, you, for example, if you follow the red line here showing landmark number two, you can see that its position within the different uh, frames will vary, and you can get an idea of where the robot is actually moving based on this location. Now, we perform this tracking on all the frames, but then between um, or at each subset or a keyframe, we basically want to summarize the tracks. And with this particular algorithm, it's going to output the tracks across the different keyframes, which is a subset of the total frames, though we are performing tracking on every single frame itself. And the, co the, the composition of these feature tracks is basically the keyframe ID indicating which frame contains this landmark, as well as the feature coordinates indicating the location of the landmark within the frame itself. The second vision front end, or second front end component that we have is the IMU front end, and this takes in measurements from the IMU itself, specifically measurements from the gyroscope and accelerometer. You can see here at the bottom that, that it happens at a very high rate. And so what we do is we perform pre-integration to basically summarize um, the state estimates based on the gyro and accelerometer per uh, keyframe. So we perform this um, pre-integration and try to estimate how the state of the drone has changed between each of the keyframes. And just to remind you what we mean here by state is the pose or the rotation of the drone itself, and then the location or translation of the drone itself. Once we have these two inputs, we send them to the back end, where they're actually fused together for processing. Primarily, the role of the back end is twofold. One is that when we do the IMU processing, there is some bias in the IMU that changes over time, and it creates some error. And so the, the goal of the back end is to fuse it with the visual data to overcome this error itself. The second thing that we want to do on the back end is that we want to update the state to minimize, by minimizing the inconsistencies between the different measurements over time. So can you imagine in the visual data, as you look at an object from different perspectives, there might be some misalignment in terms of the data. So you want to optimize and avoid and reduce these inconsistencies. So the way that this back end does this is that it formulates the problem as what we call a factor graph. So let's first look here at the bottom in terms of what the factor graph is. So shown here in the blue is the states of the drone itself over time. And you can see, for example, the landmarks in green show the relationship between the different states uh, of the drone itself over time. So the green would be the vision factors. And then similarly, we have IMU factors that, again, show the relationship between the different states. 
So the overall goal is to take these factors and we basically fit it into the constraints of this optimization problem. We solve it as a nonlinear least square uh, factor graph optimization. The other thing I want to mention is we perform this optimization over a range of keyframes, which we refer to as the horizon. So we're not just looking at one measurement or one timestamp, but we do the optimization across multiple timestamps or multiple keyframes. So as a result, the size of the factor graph can be quite large. We're talking about over 4,000 factors. And then furthermore, the factor graph itself changes over time. So it's dynamically changing based on the data that it's collecting. Once we can solve this factor graph and we have the updated states, uh, as we gener generate the updated states every keyframe, as well as a sparse 3D map. Um, let's talk briefly about the chip architecture itself. So shown here is an image of the chip architecture. We can see here on the left-hand side is the vision front end. On the bottom side is the IMU front end. And at the top, it's the back end itself. So one of the key challenges or key goals of our work is that we want to fully integrate all these different components onto the chip itself, because we want to avoid costly off-chip storage and off-chip processing, because it uh, increases the overall energy of the system, as well as overall cost. So you imagine if you want to put this on a small drone, you want to minimize the number of off-chip components. I'll just quickly highlight some of the key properties of each of these particular modules. So for the visual front end, it's doing all the image processing. It uses fixed point arithmetic. And because it's doing image processing, it can exploit parallels and pipelining. Again, it can process both mono and stereo camera images. And it typically operates at the sensor rate. So in this particular case, we can operate all the way up to 171 frames per second. After it does all this processing of the image that's coming in, it then uh, generates a feature tracks at the key frame rate. Uh, the other actual module that we have is the IMU uh, front end, which performs pre-integration. Here, we're operating at double precision arithmetic. Um, it's actually quite low cost. It's only about 2.4% of the total area and 1.2% of the overall power. Again, we're operating at the sensor rate here, so it can operate up to 52 kilohertz. And here, it's generating an estimated state every keyframe again. And then finally, you have the back end that solves that very large optimization problem to fuse both the visual data as well as the IMU data. Now, the back end also needs to run at double precision because in order to properly solve the actual optimization problem, we need to have this type of precision to prevent the problem from being ill-posed. Um, it is basically an implementation of a very complex and large finite state machine, which you can see here we break into smaller finite state machines. And then it operates at the key frame rate, in this particular case, up to about 90 frames per second. Um, and here we're updating, or the output of the back end is going to be the updated states as well as the 3D map. Um, some additional challenges for this full integration. So we might have noticed in the image that we have lots of components. In particular, in the vision front end, it contains many heterogeneous computation mod modules. So we have first feature detection, detect the important features in the image. Then you need to do feature tracking because we need to know the 3D location of these particular tracks. We also have to do stereo matching for disparity calculations. And then in both the feature tracking and stereo matching, there tends to be outliers. So we need to perform uh, ransack to reject these outliers. And there's a few other modules as well. So it's quite complicated to integrate all of these different modules onto the same system. Um, on the back end itself, as we mentioned, it solves a very high dimensional, complex factor graph optimization. Um, there are over 4,000 uh, factors within this factor graph itself. Again, it's dynamically changing over time. Um, and we need to keep the high precision in order to do uh, proper, uh, in order to properly solve this factor graph optimization. All right, so what are some of the highlights or key contributions to this work where we can actually optimize this design itself? Um, so again, here we're just showing here for completeness the full system. And when we want to integrate the full system, what th one thing that uh, tends to be challenging is the cost of the memory itself. Uh, we know that memory tends to dominate both area and power consumption, so this is something we really want to address in this work. So in particular, the memories that we're going to uh, discuss today are the frame buffers used for both the tracking and the stereo, which consume or account for about 1.4 megs. Uh, we have the graph memory, particularly the feature tracks, and uh, those account for about 90, uh, 962 kilobytes. And then we have the linear solver memory, which is around a seven, uh, 700 kilobytes. And then the key strategy we're going to take here is going to leverage compression and sparsity. So let's first talk about compression. Um, in particular, we're going to apply this to the frame buffer memories themselves. Remember, we had four of them. We're going to apply lossy blockwise image compression. And so what that actually means is we're going to break the image down into four by four blocks of pixels, 
for each of these 4x4 blocks of pixels, we're going to find the minimum and maximum value, which will allow us to determine the dynamic range. From the minimum and maximum value, we'll, compute, we'll determine what the middle threshold will be. And then what we do is for each of the pixels within this 4x4 block, we're going to compare it to that threshold. And then as a result, um, either the value is above or below this threshold. So then we can represent each pixel with one bit per pixel. Um, on the decoder side, what we receive is this value of you know, one or above or below one bit per pixel, as well as the minimum value and the threshold, and then we can re reconstruct this four by four block of pixels. And you, so you can see this is a lossy, um, a particular approach, but here, as a result of this compression, rather than using eight bit per pixel, now we only need 1.6 uh, bits per pixel, and all in all, we have a 4.4x memory reduction size. Um, here, we only apply this compression on the feature tracks and sparse stereo matching because this has the, minimum, uh, has the least impact in terms of accuracy. We do not actually apply it to detection because the impact on accuracy would, would be much larger. Uh, the second thing that we want to exploit is sparsity, um, in particular both structured and unstructured sparsity. So let's start with the structured sparsity itself. So when we look at the linear solver memory, in particular, when we're looking at solving that non very large nonlinear optimization, uh, we can actually solve that nonlinear optimization by linearizing it into a large linear system of equations. So shown here uh, is the Haitian matrix, H times the state update delta um, equals epsilon. We want to solve this equation. And I've shown here on the uh, left-hand side the, ma the Haitian matrix itself, which is 300 by 300. The size of this matrix is dictated by the size of the horizon, so many, how many frames are we optimizing across at a given time, or how many keyframes in particular. Um, there are some important properties that we can leverage here. So this Haitian matrix is symmetric, so that cuts the memory requirements down by half. And then furthermore, as you'll notice, um, it's also quite sparse. So the black blocks here show the non-zero the non uh, non values, so we can see that majority of the values within the Haitian matrix are zero. So again, we can exploit that for uh, further savings in terms of storage costs. Um, in addition, while we're actually processing this data, we can also exploit this for higher speeds, so we can get about a 7.2x speed up by only processing the non-zero values. So in summary, we're getting about a 5.2x uh, memory size reduction by exploiting sparsity, and then we're getting a 7.2x speed up by skipping the processing of zeros. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the unstructured sparsity that we have due to the feature tracks. This is both unstructured and dynamic sparsity, so it's changing over time. So feature tracks actually account for 80% of the graph memory. So again, feature tracks are those uh, vision vectors that are constraining the states of the different keyframes. Just again to remind you, in these particular uh, feature tracks, you can see that the length of the feature track will vary. So some of them go across all the keyframes, some of them do not, because sometimes the landmarks fall outside the view of the camera. So it really depends on the movement of the camera itself. So the length of the feature track vary, as well as the number of feature tracks and the starting and ending points of the feature track also vary. Um, if you want to store all these feature tracks in one particular memory, one memory itself, in the worst case, you need a very large memory, um, which is almost one megabyte of memory itself. But if you look closer at the problem, you'll realize that there's only around 200 by 20, so 4,000 unique points that are ever being captured at a given period of time. So we can actually break this memory down into two stages. So the first stage is storing the keyframe ID, which is five bits, as well as a pointer. And this can be actually quite sparse. And then the second stage is going to be storing the expensive three, uh, three points that are 64 bits each. But in this uh, expensive values, these are stored in a dense format, so it's much smaller in size. And so as a result, by taking this two-stage approach, we get a 5.4x memory size reduction. And the extra overhead of doing this is this one extra cycle of latency. All right, so what does this all get us? Let's take a look at the chip itself. So this is a Navion chip. Um, it was fabricated in a 65 nanometer LP process in CMOS. The chip area size is 4 millimeters by 5 millimeters, so 20 square millimeter itself. Um, in terms of the logic gates, in terms of Nantude gates, it's about 2 million gates. Uh, the resolution that it supports is going to be 7, uh, 752 by 480, and we'll explain why we target that uh, soon next. Um, and then overall, the amount of on-chip memory ha we have, based on all of those particular optimizations, is around 854 k bytes. The one thing I also want to highlight in this particular chip is that we have over 250 parameters that can be used to configure the chip so that it can adapt to any sensor input as well as any environments. And we'll soon see how the environments actually help in terms of energy efficiency. So in order to evaluate this chip, 
Uh, oh, so one quick thing. So if we look at the overall optimizations that we just highlighted in terms of the memory optimizations, we get in total about a 4.2x reduction in the overall memory size. So let's talk about how do we actually evaluate this chip. So we actually use the Yurok data set, which is a very challenging and widely used UAV data set in the robotics community. It consists of 11 sequences with three categories, easy, medium, and difficult. So you can see at the top row the easy sequences, where basically the drone is moving quite slowly, and you can see that the features are pretty well defined. Whereas if you look at the bottom row, which is the difficult sequences, you can have very dark scenes, and you can have a lot of motion blur if the drone is very, moving very quickly. The inputs of this Yurok data set is basically that 752 by 480, which is why we size the input of our uh, chip like that. Um, so, so what are some of the performance values for our chip? So at peak performance, so when we're running at the maximum frequency with the maximum configuration, so the largest number of keyframes, the, lar uh, the largest number of features to be tracked, um, and so on, we can run um, the visual front end. So basically, this is the camera rate at between 28 to 171 frames per second, or 71 frames per second on average. And then the back end, which is the keyframe rate, this is the rate at which we update the state of the drone. We run between 16 to 90 frames per second, so for an average of about 19 frames per second. And the power consumption is 24 milliwatts. And then the trajectory error, which basically measures the error of the drone from the, based on the ground truth compared to how far it's actually flown, um, which is around 0.28%. Now, if we configure the chip to perform in real time, and the definition here of real time is at the camera rate at which the video is captured, which is 20 frames per second, um, and having a back-end update at 5 frames per second. And then we also optimize those configuration parameters, in particular, things like the horizon, so the number of keyframes we bring into the optimization, the number of features that we're actually tracking. If we bring those all together and we optimize them for the different environments, we can actually significantly drop the power consumption down to about 2 milliwatts, and still we're able to maintain the trajectory error of around 0.27%. Now let's compare it to some other platforms, so particularly a server-scale Xeon uh, CPU and then an ARM Cortex-A15 processor. Um, you'll see here that the trajectory area of Navion is slightly higher than the Xeon and ARM processor implementations. This is due to the fact that we used fixed point in the front end. Um, and we used image compression as well. But I should note that you know, most of the state-of-the-art VIO algorithms have trajectory errors of around 0.5% or below. So we're still well within that range. Um, in terms of camera rate, you can see that Navion uh, tends to perform at higher frames per second than those particular software implementations. Similarly, with keyframe rates, Navion performs higher. Um, and then in terms of average power, Navion is between uh, 24 milliwatts at its peak and then 2 milliwatts when it's operating at real time. So if we look at the energy consumed per update, per keyframe update, um, we can see that Navion is operating um, in its optimal case 0.7, at 0.7 millijoules per keyframe and at its peak performance around uh, 2.3 millijoules per keyframe. So this adds up to about three to four orders of magnitude higher energy efficiency than processing it on an ARM CPU or an Intel uh, server-level server processor. Um, one thing I want to highlight is that we actually... Okay, I don't know if it's going to... Can you guys help play the video? So this is a demo itself of the, uh, I don't, I guess this doesn't work. Um, this is a video itself, since I don't have an ability to click on here right now, but this is the demo video. Um, and what we're showing here, and you can go to YouTube to see it, even though I can't play it here, um, is that um, taking in the video uh, at real time, it can figure out what the 3D trajectory actually is. Uh, the demo consists of both the, um, chip itself and its interface to an FPGA, which, is where allow, which allows it to take the inputs and generate the outputs. So I encourage you to go take a look um, on YouTube to play it. Or, yeah, how do you play it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Extended screen. All right. But now I gave away the ending. So now you guys know what it's actually doing. So here's the... Um, the 3D trajectory that's processing. Here's the actual demo setup with the FPGA and uh, the chip itself. You can see the power consumptions around 10 milliwatts and below, and then you can see it's plotting the trajectory in real time. And this is just displaying the keyframes. So if you looked at the actual frames that it's tracking, um, it would be much faster itself. Um, so just to summarize, here we're presenting the first fully integrated VIO pipeline on chip for robotic perception. Um, we leverage compression and sparsity to reduce the memory size itself. 
We're talking about a 4.4x reduction in image compression, a 5.2x reduction uh, using structured sparsity in the linear solver, and then a 5.4x by exploiting unstructured sparsity um, with the feature tracks. Um, Navion gives two to three orders of magnitude uh, more energy efficient than CPU implementations. Um, and we also want to acknowledge our uh, sponsors, which is Air Force, um, the Office of Air Force uh, Scientific Research and NSF. Um, if you want to know more about Navion, this is just as, as I mentioned, there are several other optimizations that we've done that we weren't able to fit in this, today's presentation. I encourage you to visit the uh, project website. We have a paper from uh, VLSI just this past year, and then a paper discussing both the joint algorithm hardware design optimization at RSS last year. Um, so one other thing to note, so Navion really focused on looking at the geometric understanding of the sensors that come in. Another important part of drone navigation is also to get a semantic understanding of your environment, meaning doing things like object detection and so on. I just want to highlight uh, two pieces of work from our group that also address this. One in particular is an object detection chip um, that we published in 2015, and in this particular chip, we're able to do object detection for ener with energy that's less than video compression. The reason why we compare it to video compression is that that's a typical default, that you would compress the video and send it up before that same energy, so below a nanojoule per pixel, we're able to do object detection at HD 30 frames per second. Um, and then some other work that we've done in the deep learning space is looking at IRIS. Uh, one particular, which we pu uh, published in 2016, uh, one particular challenge that we're looking at the second version of IRIS is to support flexibility. So we heard from the previous talk that one of the challenges is that these uh, neural nets, this, the dimensions of the neural nets continue to evolve. And so it's really important to have flexibility so that you can still be efficient across, across a wide range of neural nets, even compact neural nets like mobile nets, which only, have, let's say, have um, one particular channel for a given time. So you really want to have flexibility, and that's the focus of Iris V2. So I would encourage you to also check that out if you're interested in that topic. Um, so that summarizes my talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Vivian. If you have questions, please.